Well, the clock says seven o'clock. Welcome. Um, I'll give you a little round run, run up or rundown of how we're going to plan the evening. My name is Paula Johnson, and I'm co-chair with Eric Lindeville. We'll do an introduction to all of us on, on the group here, and Fran's going to do a presentation. And some of the members of the site may like to share some of their thoughts or that different sections, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers and comments that you all have. What that's going to be like. I think Paul will be brief and then I'll. Could you, if you can't hear me, I'll yell. Let's bring the table. Oh, can you hear me? Do you have an old mic or what do you think? All right, at this, at this, at this time, um, I will uh, pass it along so each member can introduce themselves. This has been a, a good two-year project for all of us. And there were 13 of us in Fran, and we met twice a month. Uh, we gave the members off in August and holidays. So it's been a long haul, and we still have some more work to do. And it's been an exciting time. I've certainly enjoyed it. So why don't we start? I'm uh, Mark Lockwood. I've uh, lived in Granby since 2000, and I'm currently a member of the uh, Planning Zoning Commission. Bill Kennedy, since uh, 1971, and a member of the Board of Finance. Newcomer. Um, I've been here since 19, oh dear, 61. <laughs> Eric Lukingpeel, moved here in 1984. I'm on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Barry Avery, uh, 1978, I figured it out today. I'd sit down and think about it a while. Uh, and I'm, I'm on the Conservation Commission right now. Jean Donahue Perrin, it's uh, high level math for me, but I think I've been here since 1996. Anna Saluzzo, and I'm a new girl. I moved here in 2002. Matt Garrett, and I moved to Granby in 2000, and I'm on the Development Commission. <laughs> We're going to have some humor tonight. <laughs> All right, this time I'll turn it over to Fran, and he will give us some, some background and, and a little information that will help us in this process. Well, thank you and hi. Uh, I am Fran Armentano, Director of Community Development, and I've lived and worked here for half my life. And you could figure out <laughs> the years from that. Uh, I'm going to do a brief uh, presentation. The board has told me it really needs to be brief. And then some of the board members are going to uh, say something uh, about uh, various sections. So. Um, with that, uh, let me begin. Um, I want people to know and understand uh, that the plan of conservation and development is required by state statute. Uh, it's now supposed to be done once every 10 years. And so we are updating uh, the 1993 to, 19 to 2005 uh, to today. This plan will hopefully be adopted by the end of this year. Uh, we did adopt an amendment to the plan uh, in 2006, and that was uh, based on a K Street study. The process is an interesting process. Um, the commission will come up, uh, the committee will come up with a, a draft, a final draft, and submit it to the regional planning agency. They'll submit it to the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen can decide to hold a public hearing on this matter if they want to, uh, or they can review it themselves and uh, move it back to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Planning and Zoning Commission will have to hold a public hearing. That public hearing will have to be advertised appropriately as required by statute. It'll be filed in the town clerk's office. It'll be placed on the website so everybody can see it. Uh, we have to give the regional planning agency 90 days to review it. And so it's quite a process to get it approved, um, but we hope to uh, move forward, uh, really, and uh, I think have public hearing uh, in October uh, to move towards final adoption. Um, I, I do want to say something about the members. Um, you know, three of the members were on uh, the last, uh, the last uh, plan of conservation and development rewrite, and I think at least a couple were on uh, the one previously to that. Uh, 
And it is, it's, it's really at least two hours, twice a month, uh, for two years, and they don't get paid for it, and they, they really care about the town, and I applaud them. Uh, and I'm always impressed and amazed that uh, they keep showing up. Um, and it's, uh, we couldn't operate the town without volunteers, and as a matter of fact, volunteers are mentioned throughout the plan of how important it is uh, to have volunteers to run the town, that you couldn't run it without them. So our, our development of Granby hasn't changed much since zoning was first adopted. It was adopted with the highest density in the center of town, and as you moved away from the center of town, uh, the density gets lower and lower. Uh, that's a fairly <coughs> traditional uh, development throughout Europe uh, and throughout the United States. Uh, the most the highest density uh, in the urban center, and as you move away from the urban center, it gets lower and lower. In Granby's case, it was really based on zoning, because the best soils uh, are in the center and along where what was the, and is the R30 zone, that kind of pink area. As you moved away from that area, the soils got poorer and the grades got steeper, and so we have an R50 zone in that greenish area. Then you move out to the two acre zone, which is the purplish area, and finally that lower blue area, which is the K Street area, you got the four acre zoning. So this is really traditional development uh, for centuries, um, and it's uh, how Granby has developed in the past and really under this plan will continue to develop in the future. The plan basically uh, has a statement of fundamental values which kind of directs us as to how we're going to approach development. This idea of fundamental values was developed uh, in uh, 1993 with that plan. Uh, a lot of towns have adopted that philosophy since that. We were the first one uh, to do that, come up with an idea of, let's I say, what, what our fundamental values are first and design around those values. We then have a 10-year vision, and then we have sections uh, which are there under goals and implementation. Those sections have not changed very much over the, since 1993, except that this year we had agriculture under environment. So under the environment section, we dealt with agriculture, uh, and in this plan, we actually have agriculture as a separate um, component, um, a se section which deals with goals and implementation. The members felt that it was important enough to have that as a separate item. Um, in the 10-year uh, vision, we have sections uh, on maintaining the rural character, um, on uh, dealing with the town center, keeping it vibrant, we have a section which regards uh, to our homes and where we live, uh, on town roads. Uh, we deal with the, where are we going to be in commercial development uh, and to preserve the open space. And finally, we uh, talk about the quality of life in the town. So read that section if you haven't already, uh, the 10-year vision, because we adopt the 10-year vision and they say, okay, how are we going to get there? And we get there through the various sections in the plan. Now, Granby's a fairly unique town. We uh, go from 180 feet to 1,250 feet. When we looked at that transition of density, it kind of jives with this because as you move away from the center, the elevation gets steeper and development uh, gets much more difficult. And guess what else goes along with that is our preserved open space. Our preserved open space tends to uh, be further out from the center, and we've been incredibly fortunate over the years uh, with people donating land. The vast majority of land that we have preserved uh, has been donated, starting with the McLeans and the Holcombs. Uh, the state of Connecticut is all of this land here. Mary Edwards is up here. Uh, I mean, we've been so fortunate. Ten, the, the Granby has about 23,000 acres of land. 10,000 of that is permanently preserved open space. We just had the Pelka land, which is here, and Ann Pelka, uh, they knew the Pelka family, uh, and Ann was the last to go, and in her will, she uh, donated all of her land to the Granby Land Trust. Um, that'll be showing up more and more, but that has happened recently, and as you may or may not know, Lucy Holcomb, who also passed recently on Silver Street, left extraordinary land to the Granby Land Trust also. Um, we've just been the beneficiaries of so many wonderful people preserving land. And that's why Granby isn't going to change dramatically. Uh, when you have 10,000 acres of permanently preserved open space in the hands of McLean's, the Land Trust, the State of Connecticut, you could be sure uh, that it's going to be preserved for future generations. 
when you talk about how much land is available for development, it's interesting to look at this map and understand how much is permanently preserved and how much is wetlands and floodplains and watercourses, and that's what this map shows. When you add on to that, the grades, the darker areas here are now steep slopes, which won't be developed, certainly won't be developed at any kind of density. You start to see the white areas that are left are the areas where we can uh, have development in the future. And then you add to that um, the, let's see, uh, here I've got the, the yellow areas are the developed areas already. So we have developed areas, non-buildable areas, watercourses and wetlands, uh, slopes, in permanently preserved open space, and those areas in the white are kind of the areas that might be developed. Now that is a nice area, except that that should be blue because that's Manitouk Lake. So <laughs> we don't have a lot of land really left uh, for development, uh, although people tend to think uh, it's a large community and there, are, uh, there is much room for development. Um, here is the area where you have public water and public sewer. We do think in this plan that if we're going to concentrate development and has been done in the past, these are areas where we can have more development uh, and can sustain some greater densities uh, because the infrastructure is there to support uh, that development. Again, the zoning map jives with everything I've said so far, um, including the difficulty of building in certain areas uh, and the practicality of building where you have a, a solid infrastructure. So this is our population trends through the year 2000. Uh, you can see it pretty flat until uh, 1940 after World War II. Uh, the, inf the interstate highway system comes about and we start to have some really strong development. Um, what are we gonna do here? Let's see. This is gonna do this. This computer always does this to me. So you have this straight line of development uh, going up up until uh, 2010. Obviously it's, 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 it's going off here, lowering here. And I'll show you that in a minute. Of course, we have the density of bears has gone up over those years, you may have noticed. I don't think in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1940 there were many, but uh, more and more today. Uh, and so, uh, and you can see it went from uh, 8,000, let's say, to just over 9,000, a uh, population increase of 29% to here, and then 17%, 10%, and in the last 10 years, it was 9% growth. Uh, we went from, say, 8, 9, 3, 10, 3, 11, uh, 11, 2. In the last four years, we went from 11,282 to 11,310. That's a less than 1% increase for those four years. And so when you're looking at here, 10%, 14%, 17%, 29%, now we've got less than one for four years. The average age, uh, or median age, which is really important to understand, and we'll talk about this throughout this presentation, um, is 44.6 in 2010. I uh, looked at the uh, 2014 numbers which are available, 46.7, say 47 years old is the average age in the town. Uh, that's a concern, that's significant, and it's true not only of Granby, uh, but in the state of Connecticut and other areas. And I'll go over that a little bit more. Um, and so uh, population increase was 9%, less than 1% for the last four years. Uh, you can see other towns and areas, City of Hartford, 2.6%, uh, Hartford County, 4.3%, Connecticut overall, 4.9%, United States, 9.7%, Simsbury, 1.2%, East Granby, 85 um, So 9% between uh, 2000 and 2010 was still fairly significant, but those numbers are dropping off. Uh, building permits uh, for single family homes or, or units. Uh, you can see we were in the 60s, 70s, a lot of 40s, up until 2006. Uh, 2007, the economy uh, started to go down. We've had some significant changes and the numbers have declined dramatically uh, since then. Uh, you can compare that to other towns. Um, and this goes up to 2013. Uh, and you can see where Granby is here. Um, you know, 28 units in total between 2009-2013. Um, you know, we're, we're lower compared to some of the other, other towns around us. But it's a beautiful town. And uh, this is the state of Connecticut projections uh, to 2025. And they had us go, growing to 11,826. Uh, that's a 10-year increase of 1%. They have us uh, at 11,535 um, 
as of 2015, but as we noted uh, the previous slide, the actual 2014 number, uh, there it is, was 11,310. So we're not, we're not even meeting the state's uh, estimate. For, we're not going to meet the state, after, uh, we didn't meet the state's estimate for 2015 uh, by a couple of hundred uh, people. So even that low estimate um, is, is not uh, to where we are. Um, we all know what's happening in the, the school districts. Uh, it's not true of Granby, and it's true throughout the state uh, that the educated number of, of children are declining, uh, the number of students are declining. I think that Tom made a, a significant move in recognizing this and its, its, its uh, recent action regarding current school. You gotta throw some of these in here because it's really what, what makes our town special. Um, so this is, uh, this is the numbers I went over previously, and this is the state of Connecticut projections. Again, uh, very moderate for growth uh, through 2025. I looked at Simsbury's projection through 225. This was done in 2012, and you can see Simsbury's losing population. That may change because uh, they've recently approved uh, some thousand number of uh, apartment units, and we'll see what that does. Um, but uh, in 2012, they were projecting a loss of population. There are communities throughout the state of Connecticut that will be losing population through 225. And I, we, this uh, group has been very aware of that and looking at this plan and working to keep Granby strong and to make sure that we're not one of those towns. And uh, we're all confident that people are gonna continue to want to live here for a variety of, of reasons, which I'll go into. Uh, but that's something that should be on everybody's mind, uh, that there's gonna be losses of population. It's not like it was in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Things are changing. It's changing with students, uh, and it's changing with population growth uh, throughout the state, and really throughout the country. Um, so this is more on the public school decline throughout the state. This is an interesting, uh, the, the blue numbers in the middle there are showing uh, the age between 30 and 54, and that bottom line is showing ages 65 and over, and you can see that number uh, going up. Uh, the ages, um, the, the first group at 20 to 24, uh, kind of staying the same as is the ages 20 uh, to tw 25 to 29. Um, this is, this is an interesting start just to show how many of a hundred of a hundred people, how many of those are workers. And as you look at these numbers, you can see here that uh, you have uh, the numbers 20, 20 to 64 uh, out of 130 of them would be workers. And then here, is that right? Let me just see, make sure I've got this. Yeah, this is age 65. No, I'm sorry, these are students. So this is zero to 19, you have 38. And then 65 and over, you have 30. And so that doesn't leave a lot of, a lot of workers. And so the number of workers for the number to, of elderly and young people is, uh, has been declining significantly. And when you're looking at things like Social Security, you're trying to figure out how many workers are, are there to support the people who aren't working, uh, those numbers are shifting drastically. And that's all due, of course, to the baby boom population uh, getting, getting older. So, let's see. Okay. So is that, and that, that basically was, that, that's it. So uh, that's the, uh, my presentation. Basically want to have you understand where we are, where we're going, and what the trends uh, say about where we'll be. So who is the first person who's going to speak in regards to one of those particular sections? Thank you. The uh, uh, plan, as Fran showed, has uh, different sections, and uh, several of us will go through some of those. We're not going to read the section to you, um, you know, be droning here all night, so I'm just going to do some highlights of the section. And I encourage everyone to read through the, the applicable sections because you'll see more of the details. But I'm going to speak tonight on the transportation portion of the plan. Um, and just to give you a, a first eye opener, there's no plans for recommendations for new interstate highways through Granby, um, no clover leafs, no changes. In fact, the, the plan's not really addressing adding new pavement or infrastructure to town. We're, versus rather, we're looking at the current situation and changing demographics as well as needs for the community with the rest of the plan. 
So the transportation plan addresses the transportation needs for the town because our town roadways are an integral part of our community and they need to be safe and convenient. The plan takes into account as well that transportation is not just roads and cars. Okay? There's a growing trend for pedestrian, bicycle, access and use of public transit as well as driving and there's also use of, uh, for commercial traffic both for local delivery and through driving. Overall, we want to provide an attractive passage throughout our town and a safe passage. The plan highlights they include uh, looking at problem intersections, such as line of sight and other safety and access issues. Those of you that lived here a while or even not probably can rattle off several of them right now, right? Uh, we know them, and this is really an issue of state and town partnering. Many, if not all, of these intersections involve an interaction between the town and a state highway. So there's a, a partnership there to look at these to address them. We want to provide for improved movement of vehicular and pedestrian traffic through the center of town and also look at congested points. And this is in currently being looked at, if we all know, the center intersection, okay, um, with a left turn lane. That's a problem intersection, but also has a congestion issue, as well as East Street and Notch Road and Route 10. So those are being uh, addressed in the plan and also in design phase um, with the state. But keep in mind that the plan is not looking to build a network just around peak hours. There's been discussion in the committee about this and that you don't want to build your network around one or two hours a day. Um, you know, I've changed my personal driving habits and it's amazing you leave a few minutes early, there's no congestion. So the plan is taking into account that there's changes in work patterns, more people working from home, uh, more people, you know, uh, electronic access and maybe having flex time, being able to work from their home on certain days or summer hours and that. So we're not dressing to build for peak but a level load. Recognize and support modes of transport other than the motor vehicle. The section talks about complete straight streets, safe for people, bikes, uh, access, shoulders, uh, pedestrians, so that we can have a multiple use of our roadways for access and connecting and linking current areas such as the bike trail and subdivisions, as well as enhancing and connecting a center with Salmonbrook Park on the current sidewalk initiatives. Support of public transport, uh, looking at the changing structure as we see rail infrastructure coming stronger nearby, maybe we'll be more tied into public transport. A transportation subcommittee will be part of this plan as well, and I encourage any citizen interested to look at when that comes out to participate. Finally, while it may be that Granby be on the back burner of the most significant transit innovations over the next 10 years, we must understand that the coming changes and plan to take advantage of them as they become available. Thank you. Um, my topic is the environment. It, I think it should come as no surprise um, to readers of this plan, and I, I hope some of you have gotten a chance to read it, that environment is still very prominent in the plan. It was prominent 20 years ago, it was prominent 10 years ago, and I'll, I bet it'll be prominent for many decades hence. There are 15 goals. I'm not going to go through them. And 10 of them begin with a P. We're going to preserve, we're going to promote, or we're going to protect something. And the, the rest are, we're going to prohibit something, we're going to minimize something, or we're going to reduce something else. So we're trying to keep what we have, and we're trying to prevent some things from happening to us. I, think, I don't think any of this should come as a surprise. Many people who choose to live in Granby, uh, or who choose to stay here when they might have an opportunity to leave, are doing so because they like the place. The reality is we are living in the woods. We're living with bears, we're living with coyotes, we're living with turkeys, we're living with deer, we're living with ticks. That's, that's gonna be hard to change, but to think about it. 50 years ago, we weren't living with turkeys, we weren't living with bear, we weren't living with coyotes. All that is new, and they're here because we've got an environment that will support them. I hope that, th that we don't hear any disagreement with any of the environmental goals tonight, although we, of course, we invite your, your comments. The implementation steps that we s are suggesting are quite varied. There are all kinds of things, from logging, doing a better job controlling invasive species, uh, sand and gravel operations, how we treat hazardous waste, wildlife, uh, 
All those things are on the agenda. It's, it's a long agenda. It's, it's very broad. There are a lot of things that we talk about. And in another 10 years, we're still going to be talking about them. One of the things that gives us encouragement, frankly, is we are really blessed in that we have a number of private organizations that have been very successful and very influential in how they've shaped this community. We have the Granby Land Trust. It's, if you don't know, it's one of the most successful and most respected land trusts in the state. We have McLean. We have the Salmon Brook Watershed Association, and we have the Farmington River Watershed Association. We have a very strong volunteer tradition in this town, and those organizations, the public agency we, agencies we have, like the Conservation Commission, that's all going to be key to how we address the environment and how we keep it going in the right direction. So that's all I'm going to say about the environment. Who's next? Eric uh, sort of summed up a lot of the things I was going to say. When we moved here 38 years ago, uh, being a young man who had grown up in the northwestern part of Kansas in farm country, real farm country, uh, yeah. and we were looking for a house, and uh, we were lucky enough, probably the, I think the third house we looked at was in Granby. And I drove around and I said, look, cornfields. Well, there's a dairy farm, and yeah, there's another dairy farm. There's horses everywhere. I said, I think this is where we want to move to. And th the other factor was that uh, our backyard was McLean's Game Refuge. That helped a little bit, too, being really outdoors oriented. Uh, it's changed a little bit since then. Uh, we still have dairy farms, but not nearly as many. But that's not unusual in the United States today. There are a lot fewer small dairy farms than there used to be because of economics and corporations. Uh, but we also have uh, now some things that we didn't have even 10 years ago. Our plan is not uh, sort of, as Eric said, not to change too much. We think we're headed in the right direction agriculture-wise. Uh, we have various types of agriculture that are different than what we had 10 years ago and 20 years ago. We have a vineyard, uh, we have an aquaculture uh, set up. Uh, we have a Holcomb farm and a CSA, which is a really important piece of the town. Uh, there are vegetable growers here in the past few years that we haven't had before. Uh, we still have silage fields of corn and hay fields. Uh, and we still have, like I said, a few dairies. Oh, we also have a sweet pea farm, which makes some of the best goat cheese you've ever had. Um, so it, from 10 years ago until this plan, things are pretty much the same. We want to encourage agriculture as much as we can and some of the ways we're going to do that. Uh, uh, we have an agriculture commission that has that charge to support and to grow the agricultural base in town, and they're doing a good job. Um, we've managed to buy several pieces of property, for instance, Bushy Hill Orchards, uh, which is probably a unique acquisition, uh, maybe anywhere in the state and maybe anywhere in the country for a town to own a facility like that. Uh, we also have Monrovia Nursery in town now. If, if you don't know, Monrovia Nursery is the largest single uh, horticultural grower growing organization in the country. And uh, I think they, they probably, I don't know that they have plans to expand, but at the rate uh, gardening is growing, I expect they'll be here for a long, long time. Uh, one of the things we are going to do, which we didn't have in the, the last plan, was to uh, encourage sustainable methods for the farming as much as we can, which sort of ties in to the environment. Uh, we're going to expand, or hopefully we'll expand, the pro-farm tax policy to uh, policies to give credits to agricultural land, not the, the homes, but the, the land that's in farms. And uh, we also have a goal to build a program of barn preservation. We have a lot of old barns in town, beautiful old buildings, and some of them are rather dilapidated. And I think that uh, we all agree that if 
we dressed those up a little bit and restored a bunch of them, it would really add to the, the beauty of the town. And uh, um, so with that, uh, uh, you can read through it. It's, it's not a big change. I said uh, it won't be a big change because we think we're headed in the right direction agriculture-wise. We're always, because of the, some of the really good soils we have here, their farmers are going to stay here. Some of them are families that have been here a long time. So, uh, thank you. Hi, I'm just going to briefly share a few thoughts on housing. Um, we recognise that a population, as we've already talked about, is is becoming more diverse. There's a big rise in the senior population, and our current housing stock doesn't really reflect that. So we're looking to provide um, a greater variety of housing by encouraging a um, number of different um, proposals we have here, um, active adult and elderly housing, um, allowing for higher density where infrastructure is present, uh, where the sewers and the gas lines are. Um, we we recognise there is not much space to uh, develop um, in, in the rest of the town and it just makes more sense where you've got that infrastructure there to maybe tweak the, the lot sizes a little bit. Um, encourage new affordable housing, um, perhaps smaller homes. Um, consider mixed use where it might be appropriate, again in those areas where you have um, the infrastructure to support it. <coughs> We also want to encourage uh, new construction that is um, taking into account the energy constraints and um, conserving energy going forward. And considering amending regulations so that um, accessory apartments perhaps can be detached from the main home. We're seeing um, a lot of extended families where you know maybe the, the parents, the grandparents are not able to live on their own anymore, but don't want to be um, moved away or in a home. Um, also, uh, young, the younger population, they're going away to college and then instead of flying off, they seem to be coming back again. So um, having um, the accessory apartments, you know, being opening up those regulations a little bit could take care of that. So. Um, I hope you'll all read through it and um, share your thoughts with us. Thank you. When we met on Tuesday, uh, we some of us said, well, we'll be happy to talk about it. And I said, well, I'll do open space. And then I sat down today and I thought, I don't need to lecture anybody about the importance and our love and how important open space is to us. So. This is what I wanted to share with you. This is a plan that will not sit on a shelf for 10 years until the town is required to author another similar document. It's planned to establish a committee to review and adopt a strategy for its implementation. There are many goals for each section and there will be committees formed to address these goals and their implementation. Existing commissions, such as the Agricultural Commission, many of these have already been spoken about, Conservation Commission, and the Development Commission will also be part of this process. Um, one thing that comes to mind for P&Z will be a, a rewrite of our subdivision and our um, planning and zoning regulations because we've got a lot of changes and sometimes that it's difficult for people to understand how these changes work, so we need a rewrite there. Most important is that are those people that will be willing to serve on these committees and commissions. I know both town committees sometimes have a struggle finding people to serve because that is a longer commitment. And you don't have to be a Republican or a, or a Democrat, you can be an independent. Just have to, I think you should be a voter because I think you need to be part of the process. But the commissions, uh, the, both town committees are looking for people. We will be looking for people for committees when this first group gets started. Not all of these, by the way, will be a two-year commitment, so you don't have to panic about that. Hopefully many of you will participate. Granby is a town of volunteers, and that is one of the many reasons I cherish living in this town. 
Now, as I sit here, I know so many people that are here and are already involved. So I hope that people that are looking on the TV will listen to this plea. Please get involved. Join us. Help us. We can't just do it ourselves. Thank you. Um, I guess at this point, we will take uh, comments, questions. I can just sit right. I don't think this is going to reach. It will reach. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Shirley Ryan. I live at Windmill Springs now. Just moved there last July. Um, you didn't know that. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank the Commission for all our hard work in preparing this document for the citizens of Granby. It's a wonderful document. I've spent a lot of time reading it. Tonight, I'm speaking to you as a member of the Commission on Aging. Now, many of the things that I'm going to say, you've already said, but I'm going to say them anyway. As I was perusing this document, one thing jumped out at me, and it was that our Granby population is aging. For those of you that don't know, and of course now you all know, <laughs> The median age in Granby is now 46.7. In 1980, it was 31.2. I've lived here since 1962, and I remember coming here as a teacher and um, newly married and very young, <laughs> and my, all the changes we've seen during that time. All good, by the way, most good, I should say. I was glad to see that plan recognize this and that you had planned for this throughout. The main points for our senior population centered around housing, transportation, and taxation. These are concerns that our senior citizens struggle with regularly, and it was heartening to see that you recognize that these are issues that will need to be addressed in the coming 10 years. However, just putting these goals on paper does not solve the issues. Although we have some senior housing, as our population ages, this need is going to increase. Many seniors would like to stay in their own homes after retirement. Once driving skills become difficult, they are going to need reliable transportation. Some would like to live with family, which means that we need to allow accessory ap apartments. Some will need to sell and perhaps rent. We have very few rentals in Granby. Affordable housing is now and will be a real need for many. Which brings us to taxation. <laughs> I'm not a financial wizard and I don't really pretend to be, but there's got to be some way to make this burden for the tax burden for the seniors less onerous. I don't know how that will, what that will be. It's just a big problem. Transportation, or rather the lack of, is a major problem for those of us who are elderly. The van service is running well, but we need many more vans. We cannot we cannot fulfill all the calls and people that need van service in this town at this point. Many seniors use TAP. For those of you that don't know, that's a transportation action program. It's difficult to find volunteers now to drive. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Insurance is a big issue now. Drivers are aging out. Vehicles that <clears throat> are not accessible for many older people to get into, and there are lots of other reasons. I was pleased to read the suggestions on how to solve this, and you did have quite a few ideas, but right now I don't think they're very realistic. Our economy in this state is bad, but hopefully that will change in the coming years. Our senior center is a busy, vibrant place. However, programs are hampered by lack of funding. It is not available on most weekends, and that's a time when many seniors who are living alone desperately need a place to go to socialize, and they can't. 
It's lacking many amenities that other senior centers take for granted, and I know that firsthand because I've visited quite a few of them. We don't have an exercise room with machines, a cafe, a comfortable place to sit and chat. You can just go on and on and on. We're so fortunate to have wonderful people who work so hard to make our senior center a great and welcoming place to visit, but they are not magicians. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you is, you've put the goals out for our senior population, you've put them on paper, now, could we please work together to carry at least some of them out? Thank you. Just to mention the transportation, I was at the Senior Center this week and they have a new van and it's like a minivan that's outfitted in the back for a wheelchair, which I thought was a, a wonderful addition to the two big, big ones. Do you know how they got that? I have no idea. Oh. Anyway, apparently New York City has some kind of an initiative, and they to have. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> apparently, New York City has some kind of an initiative that um, would cause them to. I, I don't know if they wrote a grant or where they got the money, but anyway, they bought all these vans, and they were going, and they had them all outfitted, as you said, handicapped. Oh, they're they're beautiful. And they were going to transport people in the city. Well, everything fell through, and they've got hundreds of these vans for sale. So the Senior Club, which, of which I'm a member and have been quite active in, has given them, gave, I, I don't remember what Sandy said the price was for the vans, but it was reasonable. But they're new. <laughs> Um, anyway, the senior club gave them $8,000 and the rest was donated. The rest of the money was donated, so the vans paid for in cash. No cost to the town. So these things do happen. Good things happen. Thank you. Okay, who's next? You've got to have a comment here. Sorry. You've got a comment, don't you? No. No. <laughs> You got to say something. I haven't. Uh, I've skimmed the plan and I haven't read it in uh, in detail, but it looks like a, a good piece of work. Uh, I just wanted to mention that this morning, and perhaps other people saw this, that um, West Hartford was uh, awarded or was characterized as uh, number two in the nation in a complete streets policy and uh, which I uh, just read a little overview of it and that it seemed to be um, forward thinking something that could perhaps find its way in this plan something that could be, get work done in the future and would seem to uh, work well with our aging population I, I think the idea is when streets are when new streets are put in or are they modified there's room for bicycles, there's room for pedestrians, um, wheelchairs, et cetera, in that. And it's, you know, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's putting a policy in place. And it's just a few miles from here. You could get a copy of it. They'd, I'm sure they could send it over. And anyway, um, um, just, it seemed like that would, that would, you know, might fit in, find a way into this plan somehow. So that's it. Thanks. Good, good job. Just, just to speak on that, the, the plan does address uh, complete uh, streets. It was something we've talked about quite a bit. Of course, it will work best uh, where you have density, and so really we're, uh, we're looking at the center um, area uh, first and foremost, and then as you move out from the center, continue to think about complete streets in some of our other neighborhoods. Um, when you look at the plan, and as I've discussed a little bit, where we see the most changes along infrastructure. You mentioned West Hartford, Blueback Square. That's where people want to live. They want to live in walkable communities. We've talked to Ann, our real estate agent, and uh, said, what are, what are people looking at? Uh, what are the most desirable places today? And they want <coughs> smaller lots with public water, sewer, uh, and, uh, and gas. And we don't have uh, that 
available here. But we could. There are locations where we can create uh, some smaller lots um, where people can live. Uh, if you look at, I mean, it's not unusual, Ice Pond, for instance, the last subdivision uh, in Granby on the Simsbury line. Smaller lots, public water, public sewer, they sell very well. Um, a lot of the elderly people, <coughs> people who are getting elderly, uh, don't want the two acre, three acre lot anymore. They'd like to move in a, on a small lot where they have very little maintenance. We don't have that product, but we think we can. That product would actually help to diversify the tax base too, because we talked about what's happening with education. And we no longer have to fear the students uh, <laughs> driving up uh, our taxes. Every house we add, we think, uh, helps to, to uh, benefit the tax base uh, in the future. And so we are looking at housing for a number of reasons. For the tax base, to diversify the, uh, the economy, to diversify the age group, and to get people living here and appreciating Grammy the way we do, who then may trade up from that apartment or that smaller lot uh, to a two or three acre um, location closer to the open space. So uh, we think that's a big part of this plan, is to get people to understand that walkable communities are what um, people want today. We have a lot of emphasis on the center. Uh, we think the center is really going to be uh, one of the major places uh, to be in this town in the very near future. We have so much interest uh, development-wise in the center. Um, and uh, we see that continuing. And so we think more housing in the center where people could walk to our wonderful businesses uh, would be uh, really important and, and good uh, for the town uh, in so many different ways. So if you look at this plan, I think you'll see that. Uh, increasing density and development along the uh, infrastructure. And as you get away from the Grand Center, you have lower and lower density and more bears. And, I, I, Eric missed moose. There was a moose on Mary Edwards' property a couple of days ago, so uh, even, even the moose are moving in. So. Are you happy to hear it, friend? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I am. I can't get that Miata underneath their legs. Uh, well, we, we're, uh, we've got this hot microphone here. And we're, we, we really, our intention here is not to present a plan and have us do a lot of talking. We would like to get you doing some talking, how do we react to these things we've got, and, and have we missed something? If we missed something, we'd be happy to hear. Carol, maybe we missed something. Yeah. Here we go. I've, I've reread the uh, report a couple times, and I'm really impressed with it. And I read, I see something in it that I hadn't noticed the first time. Every, you know, you read something new. One of the things I'm sure was added this last 10 years is your support of the arts. And I was really happy <laughs> to see that in. I don't know if that was there. I was looking for things that could have been changes from 10 years ago. Is there anything that, anything else that points out is changes your approach to managing the town that res rather than 10 years ago, other than the demographics and the, yeah, I, I, I think for me, and that's what I kind of I try to speak a little bit. Um, I know Eric and I have. Eric and I have been through this two times before, and the first time I know we both of us sat down and we wrote a little list of things that we thought should be done, and we both had them, and we, in 10 years we looked and thought, you know, we did a pretty good job. This last time we kind of did the same thing, but issues came up that we had to take care of as opposed to those little things that we had. So that's why I think it's really important to get a group together, a commission, whatever you want to call it, a group that will go through this like you've done, and say, all right, in transportation, this is something for the trans a transportation group, as Mark said, that's going to look at what has to be happening and can be proactive. Um, the Commission on Aging, I didn't mean to leave you out because I used to be on it too, Shirley. But the senior issues, the different issues we've said, we need to make sure they don't get shelved and put aside. And that won't happen unless we have a group like this that will say, all right, Agricultural Commission, we want you to look at how do we, how do we define a farm store? What, have we left out something that where something could occur that it shouldn't? We want to make sure that it's clear as can be. Um, and these are the kind of things I think that we've talked about. And I think if we start there with this group, and I'm hoping we're going to find some people that are going to be excited about doing this to go through it, pull out what we think. Um, 
start a couple of committees, get the committees and commissions that are already going, the development commission. We talked about a Granby brand. We didn't really talk about it tonight, but what is our Granby brand? How do we publish it? How do we get it out to the world? It's horseback riding, it's bicycling, it's gardening, it's the arts, it's the, all the things that we have in Granby that we all, our, our hiking and our open space, and we have a, you know, and we have the vineyard and the senior center. I mean, and, and we do have a good transportation system for the seniors, but as you said, it, it, it always is gonna need more. I had another thought too. Uh, it, certainly with my experiences this year with the, going through some zoning issues, and, um, is that there's a changing science out there. And it's more important than ever before to understand the need and I'm so happy that Granby is a place that wants to preserve water and save water. But it's so important that we stay up to date with the best practices for agriculture and with the new codes that have support. I know that because of the issues that I referred to, that there have been some papers that have been presented to you by uh, Wetterman and Dr. Cortman and on uh, and I hope that you can also cite those for people to use as resources. You have some other excellent sites, and now some of which I would question, you know, I, I hadn't heard about, so I wanna know more about those cases, but uh, like K Street, you always refer to the K Street study, and I don't know anything about that. But, but I think that there's, a need for education. I like the idea of the Agricultural Commission to, and volunteers taking that over uh, to some degree. I think that teaching best practice, practices for agriculture can save so much problems for both the farmers and the residents that um, and a lot of disputes could be, could be amended or, or prevented. And um, what was the epithet? I keep forgetting. I have such bad recall. <laughs> I'm getting old and I need to see you. <laughs> but um, I thank you again, all of you, for a wonderful job. I'm really impressed with the, the piece as a whole. And um, I spoke with you earlier and I, there are a lot of things in there that I really like about the saving of the water and the agri yeah yeah thank you. You know we mentioned uh, change and what's the change? Uh, the biggest change I think that we all came up, uh, away with in the discussions was the change in the demographics. You know, ten years ago nobody thought uh, for a second that uh, any town should be losing population anytime soon. And as we look at it today, we realize that there are towns that are going to lose population. There are towns that are, that are perhaps going to fail. Um, but Granby won't because of our brand, as Paula uh, mentioned. But we've got to get that brand out there. We've got to define that. For many, many years, people moved to Granby primarily for what? Education, Schools. of course. Schools. Education. Or a Where's horse barn. Or yeah. a horse barn. No, but, but primarily, <laughs> primarily <laughs> <it was> for <laughs> education. They came here and they recognized our education system was very important. They had younger children, and they came here for education. Where's education going to be in 10 years? With magnet schools, with, with, with reductions in, in students, uh, with students being able to make choices as to where they can go to school. I, I don't think any of us are sure exactly what the educational system is going to look like 10 years from now. We may think we do, but it really, change is happening so quick. And so I don't think we could depend on people moving here um, primarily for the educational system. Uh, we talk about the plan that it's so important to have it to maintain an excellent uh, system as it has been for many years. That's very important. But I don't think we can hang our hat on the educational system. The open space, the recreation, the events, the arts, uh, all of that is talked about in this plan. And there are some wonderful things that happen in this town. Uh, and so we've got to get that word out and we've got to make it attractive for other people to continue to move here. And so really that I think is something we're going to work on right away after this plan is adopted <coughs> is to establish a brand and promote that brand um, and continue to make this town an exciting place to live. Carol. And we could be branded as a leader in saving our water. We have such great resources here. And 
And we could be leaders in that. Hey, by the way, I don't know if everybody is aware of it, the, uh, the house in Washington forwarded the bill to make the lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook wild and scenic rivers. And I think that's going to go all the way through. So pretty soon we'll have a, a bigger mandate to protect things than than we do right now, but we'll also have help doing it. Mm -hmm. We already have help with this yeah. case that some of you haven't read yet, where proof of the cause and effect of, um, of killing fish is, is now there's, there's some teeth <coughs> the boards can do to help assist um, saving water. That's okay, I might need a microphone. Oh, well, you see. We'll see. All right. Um, first, thank you very much to the commission for the work that you all have been doing. I'm a little bit familiar with it, uh, my wife being on the commission. Um, is there a sense of priority of the items that you've talked about today? Have, have they been racked and stacked at all in regards to which ones are most pressing? And, and, and if not, that would be something I would recommend the committee does. We, we, we don't have endless pool of resources <laughs> and, and, and people to work with us on this. So if having some sense of priority would be very useful. Um, the, the, the item that I think about a lot is entry to market, market in housing. Um, I just don't see how my children can afford to live here. Uh, will be able, or there's even a place for them to come here to live here, even if they wanted to. And, and, I, and so I'm wondering, with what you all talked about, how, what is something different that is going to occur that's going to open that door? Is there something that you all talked about that said, you know what, by doing these things and endorsing this kind of thinking, which may be different, uh, is going to create those opportunities? Because I agree with you, if we don't get the young people coming in, we're all going to be sitting on houses that we can't sell. We're not going to have a tax base to take us forward. We continue to buy open space. We continue to lock that up. That, that doesn't leave much to grow that housing here. So those are questions in the back of my mind is, what of your report will help us, help the next 10 years um, set that stage and, and maybe is something different to try or is something different to head to? And I'll, and I'll hear your response on that. Thank you. I think looking at um, the available places where we can develop, it, it makes sense to increase the density where we have the infrastructure to support it. So perhaps having a multi-family um, apartments, uh, having um, you know, smaller lots there so you can put more homes um, down that area where you have the gas lines and water lines to support it. And, and smaller homes there, not just smaller lots, but smaller homes, so that they're going to be more affordable to the young single people, the, the older seniors that are, you know, don't want to be maintaining the big, big property anymore. Yeah, I think she's uh, uh, accurate with that. And uh, let me just say that we re recently approved 34 apartment units, which are uh, at the end of Doe Pond, kind of behind Stop and Shop. Uh, they're being constructed as we speak. Uh, my phone rings uh, regularly, people asking who they can contact uh, to be on a waiting list to get into those apartments. Again, it's only 34, but it is what people want. Um, I think uh, we can bring people into town. They may be in an apartment for a few years, and as they get more economically stable, uh, learn to love the town, and uh, move out from the apartment to some of our existing homes or new homes. Um, I think that uh, we could probably support some additional units like that, um, and wouldn't be surprised if we see applications in the future for that, that type of use. That comment you just made about um people becoming more economically stable. Research is showing now that it is not a bad thing to be renting yeah. under certain circumstances, and that needs to be taken into consideration. The other thing that is that I thought of when I thought about those apartments is, once again, you're going to have to have a car. I mean, you can't spend your whole time at Stop and Shop and TJ Maxx. And so 
you, you've got to have a car. We, you know, it's great. Those apartments are going to be great for people that can drive. They certainly aren't going to fill the need for anybody older. I mean, not, uh, at least not right now. That's a very interesting point. I read something in the newspaper the other day that said um, uh, cars that will be able to drive us and not pay any oh, attention yes, yes. Are, are, are coming up quick. They're, well, they're not here yet, but they will be. I mean, so, uh, somebody recently said we tend to underestimate the change, or we tend to overestimate the change that's going to happen in the next two years, and we underestimate the change that'll happen in the next 10. I, I think in 10 years, some of the problems that we've been talking about may be solved, at least partially, by improvements in technology. We'll see. No, on that, on that part of uh, infrastructure, needing infrastructure, and we want to do the dense, uh, dense housing around the infrastructure. I understand that, but when I uh, work at a place like the Hartford and I see a lot of young people coming into there and working, and a lot of them work remotely, by the way, yeah. they don't necessarily need to be next to the infrastructure. They'd be just as happy and even happier to be out in the woods in something that they can ride their bike because they're going to oh, work from true. home. Until they and that's going to grow even more. So the dependency on infrastructure is going to change. So I, I wonder if, did we have, were there any discussions on how that demographic can start to play in regards to the need of the dense infrastructure? We, we all started considering from a senior sell-off, which certainly has started and is going to continue for quite a few years, we have that product available. We have houses uh, throughout Granby on the two-acre lot uh, or more that will become available or are available now. Uh, and so if people want that, and, and you mentioned a very important point of working from home, and this plan recognizes that also. We anticipate that up to 25% of the, of the working population will work from home in coming years. Uh, we talked about retailing. You know, Amazon recently uh, had, we had higher sales than, than Walmart. Uh, so uh, the whole industry is changing. So offices, you can't count on offices, people who work from home, retailing, people are buying online uh, more than they're going to stores. All of that has an impact uh, on our economy and on where people want to live. Um, I just go back to, we don't have the product of the smaller lot. And so we have people who want to live in, stay in Granby. They don't want their large house with their large acreage and their maintenance requirements. They'd like to move into either an apartment uh, or a quarter acre lot with a small yard uh, on public water and public sewer. And we don't have that product for them. And uh, so I think it'd be important to create that product. I just want to add one thing to, I think prioritizing, we can look at some of that maybe in one of our next meetings. But also, this is a plan, right? This group here, this isn't a uh, thing that we as a group now go and we have a magic wand, as somebody said, right? And that we're the implementers. This plan is used to guide the town, the elected boards, the volunteer boards, uh, and, and, and other interested parties in what we should be doing as a town community, okay? And what can we do, okay? The elected boards and the other boards, you can set policy, okay? The zoning, we can change zones. We don't build houses. Okay? We're not talking about becoming a, uh, you know, a builder of buildings. We have to have a climate and environment that meets these goals. Uh, other boards, it could be the select board, board of education, will there's infrastructure. Okay, infrastructure is part that this plan can do. Uh, and finally, the plan is used by outside parties. They come to town, and if they see that there's some things in there, maybe it's a housing, or maybe it's a mixed-use development or something, or center, 
and they come and they say, Granby is interested in supporting us for this. I can see it in their town document. I'm going to go to the appropriate board and pitch my plan because I know that they're interested in it. So this is a document to get uh, both private party uh, interest as well as governmental interest in the direction. But by itself, it doesn't, it doesn't create a house. It doesn't create a bike path. It doesn't create a uh, new commercial um, retail or other establishments. I just wanted to, it's all up to all of us and in the climate that we set. And ben, you talked about prioritizing and that, that first group that we'll get together will go through and set up some of the goals that we want to do and accomplish and then look at whether we have to start another committee that's going to work on bike trails, let's just say something like that or something for the agricultural group. This, these are some things that are listed in here. Please take a look at them and see what you can do and how you can work to accomplish those goals. When I think you had something. I probably don't need that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Len Murray. I've been uh, in Grammy since March 28, 1953. I think one of the longest living people here. I grew up here. I went to school here. I got married here. I bought a house here. My job had me travel all over the country. So I've worked from Maine to California, all kinds of driving problems. And I wanted to address the intersection. And I hope that this, the changes take care of the problems that I've run into several times, and it happened to me again today. Coming north on 10 and 202 from the Granby Park, in the right-hand lane to go straight with the first student van that I drive during the day, taking special ed kids to school, picking them up. I'm in the right-hand lane, and the car pulls up in the left-hand lane. The light changes, and the guy drag races me. Yeah. Yeah cuts me off or gets behind me and then takes a right to go down Route 20 to East Granby. Now maybe the intersection change won't change that, but maybe we need a cop posted there to arrest these people uh, who don't know how to drive or are really out of whack here. But uh, I want to tell you that uh, in my travels, I couldn't wait to get back home here to Granby. I think that a lot of people feel that way. I think that uh, the, the board is discussing the plan. One of the things we say over and over is that we really like uh, living in Granby. We feel most people who live here really love living in this town. And uh, I think others who move here in the future will feel the same way. Isn't that something that, that comes up regularly about uh, how much we enjoy living in the town of Granby and how good it's been to us? Jim, you want to? Jim, First time ever. 
I was surprised and delighted because I had lamented on our side of the road not seeing the bear. You go north, you go south, you go east, and you go west, and you have, <coughs> if I quote some people, you have to put up with the bears. Believe me, neighbors, it's a delight to put up with the bear. How many of you have the bears and how many of you don't? <laughs> yeah. all, all right. Uh, how many don't have bears? All right. There's a peculiarity in, in North Granby Road that uh, from the field north of the North Firehouse, south to pretty close to the uh, where's Rafi's live. For some reason, live wildlife does not like that in there. We used to get a have some sheets up here if uh, you have comments that you would like to give to us that you didn't want to stand up and give. Also, if you're interested in being any of the, of the uh, little committees that we're thinking about, you want to help, put your name, say, want to help. Carol, have something else? Somebody else here? And the form basically has my email, and if you wanted to uh, send a comment, you could send it directly to me, and I'll get it to the committee, 
and I'm sure they'll be happy to hear and can consider. So really, thanks to everybody for coming. It's, uh, I think it's been very useful. Hot mic's still available. Going once, going twice. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.